My name is Judy Carver, and William Golding was my father. In this talk, I want to describe his transition from living as a boy in Marlborough to his status as an independent adult. Home life in Marlborough was very influential and it profoundly affected my father's life even after he had left home. His father, Alec, was senior teacher, deputy head in effect, at Marlborough Grammar School, a small state-supported school, selective and co-educational for children from 10 to 18 years. Eventually, the school outgrew the building you can see in the photograph and it became a junior school. Pupils at the grammar school were drawn from the locality and from a wide range of social backgrounds. They were children of local shopkeepers, farmers, farm labourers, garage owners, hotel keepers, as well as lawyers, local lawyers and school teachers, as in the case of my father and his brother. About a mile away at the other end of town was Marlborough College, a private fee-paying boarding school for boys, termed a public school in the UK, which catered for boys mainly from affluent families. Its pupils in the 20s and 30s were not local and were from a very different social class from the children at the grammar school. Boys from the college often went on to elite universities and entered the professions of the establishment. In the terms of the time, they were top shelf people and they could expect to run companies or become senior government officials. There was a sharp divide between the two schools, both in social class and in expectation and their respective pupils mostly took very different paths. Though the co-educational grammar school did sometimes send children to universities, my father and his brother, for example, went straight from the grammar school to the University of Oxford. This was relatively unusual. Here you can see the two separate entrances a bit more clearly. The main entrance into the building is actually the one under the boys' arch now, and that was the door I went through a few years ago to look at the building. And it was a really extraordinary moment for me to see the place where my grandfather had taught for 40 years and where his two sons, my father and my uncle Jose, went to school. I still a few years ago, 10 years ago, I suppose, I used to run into people who had actually been taught by him. And many of them had stories about how he had changed their life. I remember one man telling me how 50 years before, Alec had given him his first glimpse through a microscope and how this had set him on the road to be a scientist. And there are many other stories of Alec's kindness and diligence and approachability. Alec came up the hard way. He was the son of a bootmaker from a suburb of Bristol called Kingswood. And he was only able to become a teacher because his parents very kindly and generously allowed him to stay on at school later than the legal leaving age instead of leaving and earning his own living and adding to the family income. And I think he remembered this generosity later on when my father was at Oxford and he made a request of my grandparents that also required great, great generosity. Alec was a gifted and I think inspiring teacher. My father remembered his lessons, especially science lessons, for the rest of his life and wrote about them in his journal. Because they couldn't afford much equipment, uh, Alec would mime experiments 
And this extraordinary gift for both drama and storytelling, I think, also uh, came my father's way and I think was influential in him becoming a writer. He learnt how to structure things so that people paid attention. However, Marlborough isn't famous for its grammar school. And my father always felt that the town sloped up towards the college. And he always felt a sense of a grieved inferiority, I think, because of the status that the college had. And he felt this also on behalf of his father, who he felt had not been sufficiently appreciated. So class for him became part of the aspect of the world you couldn't control, the aspect of the world that was outside Alex's secure framework that he had created. And also, I think it began for my father somewhat to contradict Alex's very hopeful view of the world. In Lord of the Flies, Jack is clearly from a fee-paying school, a choir school, and I think it's probable that Ralph is from a boarding school as well. Piggy, of course, is definitely not. He's working class, he has no father, He's brought up by his auntie, who keeps a sweet shop, which I imagine is really a corner shop. And Piggy doesn't have the easy, entitled confidence that Ralph and Jack have. He doesn't uh, do public speaking with the same ease that they appear to. He's more coherent than Ralph when he does speak, but he's less assured, and he is the one who says, I've got the conch. It's tragic, I think, in the novel that Piggy's outstanding intelligence can only take him so far. The world won't take that much notice of his warnings. And I think he is linked in this, in my father's mind, with Alec. And the issue of class in the novel and in my father's life was of enormous, enormous significance. I love this photograph. It's a picture of my grandfather, Alec, in a science lab at the grammar school, answering some query from a pupil, the pupils on his right. And you can see Alec is completely absorbed in the query and has confidence that the rest of the class is just getting on with it. And his absorption is matched by that of the boy, if you look at the boy's face. And I think that is a really good clue to why Alec was such an effective teacher and why he earned the trust of his pupils. My father says, portraying his father in a novel called Free Fall, that Alec coped with discipline by just assuming that children would behave. And while in some contexts I think that wouldn't work, it seems to have worked very well for Alec. I think people liked him and wanted to be liked by him and behaved accordingly. And I think this photograph is a very good indication of what he was like at work. This is my father with his elder brother, Jose, just on the point of going off to Oxford. And I always find this photo very poignant because my father's smiling and no doubt looking forward to Oxford. But for him, his time at Oxford was very unhappy. And that was partly because it was difficult for him to break away from home and partly because the issue of class really followed him to Oxford. When my father got to Oxford in the autumn of 1930 at Brasenose College, naturally at that time an all-male college, he found that he was the only grammar school boy in all his years intake in the college. All the other boys were from public schools. And I don't think this made him feel very good. 
He also had a problem with his subject. He'd gone up to read science, and he later says that this was really to please his father. But uh, neither his talents nor his tastes, I think, really lay that way, and this became clear to him. And eventually, at the end of his second year, he went home to his parents and asked if he could change from science to English and also do an extra year. And his parents, I think in his father's case, remembering the generosity of his parents, um, they agreed. And this was particularly kind and forgiving of them because the previous term, my father hadn't actually been at Oxford at all. He'd bunked off and gone to Cornwall, his place of happiness and tranquility, and had spent the term there just kind of lounging around and reading books and learning to sail and actually having a love affair, uh, which my grandparents didn't know about. But he did secure their consent for him to change subjects and to do an extra year. And I think from that point on, his studies became exciting and good and in the end he graduated with a very respectable second considering he'd done the whole degree in two years. He also did make friends at Oxford although he felt very lonely when he was there but he made one lifelong friend and two other friends were classical scholars and they introduced him to Greek and Latin literature which was an enormous plus in his life and something for which I think he did give Oxford some credit. The lifelong friend was a man called Adam Bittleston, and he was very intriguing to my father, as well as very likeable, because he represented two things that had been completely missing from his life. He was upper class, he was related to various bits of the nobility, and he was also profoundly religious. He was a follower of the Christian thinker Rudolf Steiner. And we have two very specific things to thank Adam for. He got my father a teaching job at a Steiner school in London. But before that, he also took a batch of my father's poems and sent them to a relative of his, a Harold Macmillan, who worked for the publishing firm of that name. And in 1934, just after my father graduated, this volume of poems was published and it started my father's career as a published writer. He was always a bit ashamed of this volume of poems but I think one must remember he was only 23. This is my father's book of poems. Now, I believe a very rare book, largely because the unsold stock, which I think was a great proportion of the entire stock, was lost in a bombing raid in World War II. Uh, my father was ashamed of it and remembers on one occasion going into a second-hand bookshop, buying a copy of the poems, taking it outside and tearing it up. He was then greatly chagrined to discover that it was quite a valuable book because of its rarity, and I think probably because of its association with him. But he never felt that it represented his true voice as a writer, and I think it has to be said that's, I think that's right. Another aspect of his life after Oxford is worth remarking on, although he himself didn't know about it. The Oxford Appointments Board, which was really the sort of career service, had a card under his name neatly marked with the initials NTS. And this stands for Not Top Shelf. And further down, there's a little note which says, fit only for day schools, 
although it also notes that he doesn't have much of an accent. I'm really, really glad my father never knew that, but it does show that he wasn't paranoid in feeling that people at Oxford looked down on him. However, he did leave. He taught at the Steiner School for a year and a half, and then he got a job at a grammar school in Maidstone, the boys' grammar school. It was much bigger than the one in Marlborough, but still I think it was a world he was familiar with. His father was a teacher there his, at Marlborough. His brother was a teacher at a grammar school in Grantham. And my father thought he would probably slot in OK at this much larger institution. And he did, I think, have a useful time there at the school. But Maidstone was also instrumental in his life in another way because he met a young woman in Maidstone and she was my mother and basically, I think, turned my father's life around. This is a photograph of my mother taken around the time uh, she and my father met. My father never liked this photograph, partly, I think, because it was taken for somebody else, for her then fiancé, and partly because, as he said, it made her look as if she simpered. And it's perfectly true, she really didn't simper. She was a very strong-minded woman, very clever, brave, and utterly committed to my father and his writing, which is lucky for all of us, I think. Since they were both engaged to other people, this marriage in 1939 caused a great rift on my father's side. His parents were very fond of his former fiancée, knew her well, loved her. Alec had taught her at the grammar school. She was a local girl. I think they felt the town would be very disapproving, as I think it probably was. But my parents felt that they were right to be together, and I think that is true. Eventually, my grandparents, I'm glad to say, came round to accepting my mother, partly because they could see how happy she made my father, but partly I think they, they loved her for herself too. But her commitment to my father's writing and to his well-being generally, I think, was a huge, huge factor in his life becoming better. My father always needed a great deal of reassurance. And remarkably, this continued even after he'd won the Booker Prize and been awarded the Nobel Prize. And my mother was very good at giving him this reassurance. And also, she managed to combine such reassurance with a certain amount of honest and carefully worded uh, criticism. And this, I think, was as necessary as the reassurance, though, though possibly not as welcome. But it's to her credit, not only that she gave it, but that he took it. In April 1940, my parents moved to a small village called Barachalk in Wiltshire so that my father could take up a post as a teacher in Salisbury. In the ensuing war years, my father found the differences between his father's views and world events harder and harder to reconcile. And through the security and love of my mother, I think he at last found the courage to confront those differences. And in the next talk, I shall examine the process whereby he did that during the years of the Second World War. 
My thanks are due to the people and institutions listed here, especially to Nicola Presley. This is the address of our website, which contains quite a lot of information about my father and about Lord of the Flies, but also about his other, other novels. And there is also a specific link which gives support for students and teachers. So please do have a look. Thank you.